everyone. I'm Deborah Gardner, the host for Hospitality Today Live, where my amazing guests that love to share their perspective, opinions, stories, and lessons right here live with me today. And I am so thrilled to know that you are going to be in for a very special treat here on this episode. We have an Ohio native that actually has been in DC for the last 43 years. She founded her consulting business back in 1981. And I am talking about the icon of the industry, Joanne, uh, jo Joan Eisenstahl. I had Joanne last week. Um, but we have also the fact that we know she is an icon because she's been on the MPI Board of Directors, the chair of ASAE Ethics Committee. She has won amazing awards in the industry, like being inducted to the EIC Hall of Leaders. She has the highest Lifetime Achievement Education Award from PCMA Foundation. And I mean, the list goes on with IACC, NSA, HSMAI, MPI and on and on. And today she actually is going to be here with us because usually she talks and focuses, focuses on the meetings design, the risk and uh, contingency planning, contract issues, and so much more. But like I mentioned, she is here today with us and you and I get the opportunity to learn from Joan what ethical behavior means today. Find out what guides you ethically. And also watch as Joan transparently shares what ways does the industry support or negate ethical behavior. The MPI International Board actually mentions her, the, con the actually the conscience of the industry, a mantle Joan wears very, very well. So stay tuned. This is one episode you do not want to miss. Today is Tuesday, March 2nd, and this episode is actually sponsored by Versator. Let the site tour come to you, versator.com. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to introduce to you the one and only Joan Eisenstadt, who is in the house. <laughs> You're so funny. Um, thank you for that. Oh, I, you know, it, it, I, I will tell you that I'm very glad you did say what day and it was and month because I, um, the other night on watching something on television and there was a, a, an ad for Easter candy and I said oh. to my spouse, I said, Easter candy, didn't we just do Easter? And, and, and I realized it's a new year. We did yes. Easter, we're still in the sort of same place we were. Um, so thank you for that. Um, <laughs> thanks. Thank you for having me and, and talking today about what for many is not a sexy subject. <laughs> yeah, no kidding, right? But before we get into this, because this hour is going to go so fast with you, with all this information, um, we know we are stuck. We are in a, a, a definitely um, ill will type of situation with the industry right now. And I just saw that even this morning, the U.S. Department of Labor um, mentioned the updated version of the meetings industry or the hospitality industry in general of 5.5 million jobs have just disappeared. Mm -hmm. And yet we were hoping that, you know, things will turn around faster than they need to. But we don't know if that's going to happen or not. We know last Thursday uh, there was a bipartisan bill to help jolt the industry was introduced to the Senate floor. But but how fast is this really going to turn around? What's your perspective and opinion of what's been going on, Joan? You know, it's interesting, Deborah, and and I think as we talk today, it's there will be there are ethical implications around all that's happened. Um, with as a result of COVID, as a result of job loss, as a result of 
um, what we're having to deal with. Um, I, I don't have a good prediction. I think that people have been, um, have been hopeful. I think that they are, um, and some groups are in fact meeting physically together. Um, I think that the, there are a lot of, there are so many issues that I think are not being discussed around what will happen. Um, Dr. Michael Osterholm from the University of Minnesota is one of my go-to people um, in addition to the World Health Organization and looking at what the future is going to be and what it's going to look like around um, this, this virus. And the way that it is mutating, um, his predictions have not been as rosy as others. Um, I, I tend to be a realist. I would rather be a realist and plan around those issues. I think that what, you know, it's interesting. One of the things that I think in terms of how do we move forward, it's not just about money, it's about lives. And if we call ourselves a hospitality industry, we should be concerned about each other. Um, there are still people today who don't want a mask. Um, there are people who, uh, I, I'm, people are fed up with being um, confined to some part of their lives. And there are people who have to go out, who cannot work at home um, if they have work at all. And, and we're in a very tough situation. And to me, it's, it, you look at things holistically and you look at how it impacts others um, as well as your individual and the industry bottom line. It's complicated. Um, and so um, I, 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 it, it's been interesting to watch the various predictions. The um, um, HNLA said at one point, they thought we would all be back to gathering and to face-to-face um, -face meetings, meaning physically face-to-face by the end of this year. And recently they said 20, uh, 2025, um, when we would be back to something resembling 2019. I, we're not ready. We're simply not ready. There are still hotels that are closed. There are hotels that are understaffed. Um, I don't, I don't know. I think that it's, I think that we have to, um, as Dr. Fauci and others have said, um, the virus is leading us. We can't lead the virus. I saw today that there that there's now um, an opportunity for more vaccine to be produced. And I think that's great. For a lot of us, it's getting the vaccination that has become problematic. So um, it was a very long-winded answer to the yeah. question. I don't think that there is any, there's no simplicity to any of this. No, there really isn't. And, and it's, it's interesting that you say this because this is the first time I'm hearing that, you know, somebody actually is, is, is sharing the realistic side of things. We want to be hopeful. Um, we want things to turn around and we hear leakage of some in-face meetings happening. Um, but is it really the in-face? Um, I mean, already we lost a half a million dollars just you know, just what's been happening the last year. And that's 10 times the negative economic impact of 9-11. And that, right. that's what U.S. travel was telling us. And and yet we we keep trying to push ourselves back, you know, to the meetings. As a matter of fact, uh, Sheriff, um, the you know, who's the head of PCMA, I remember him saying back a, a year ago, saying, you know, we're not rushing to meet, we're rushing to educate. And he's right. He's right. We shouldn't be rushing back to in person until we're able to do this right. Yeah. And in a year we have lost, we're up to over 515,000 or million, sorry, 550 million people. And um, in the D, I live in Washington, D.C., right. and in the D.C. area, so D.C., Maryland, Virginia, we're, we've now gone over a million cases um, of COVID. And, and now there isn't as much testing. People are instead trying to get a vaccine. So we really don't know now what the number of cases are. I know that some of the industry said there may have been that many deaths, and let's look at all the recovery. And then if we look at recovery, we also have to look at the people who are what they call long haulers, right. um, the people who have symptoms that don't seem to go away. And I, I saw last night 
that um, there's, uh, I think, I forget how many billions of dollars is now going into research on the long haulers um, and what their what the impact is on them and what the impact will be on the future of work. So all of this impacts everything we do in the meetings and hospitality industry. Yeah. And, and yeah. I and I need to do something because. Um, because I know best to do this for my friends yes. and lawyers. I don't want to do a disclaimer um, yes. that everything I'm saying is my opinion. It's based right. on reading. It's based on experience. Um, and anything I say that sounds like it's advice on how you should behave um, <laughs> is purely my opinion, not to be taken as legal advice. Always contact your lawyer or other um, right. paid professional. So right, right, <laughs> right. But you know what? You've been in the industry longer than most, and uh, and just such your your brilliancy has always been uh, spot on. So I know that we need to take to heart to what you say and what you what you think because you've been there, done that, and and yet we keep thinking that you know every time the industry gets back up and running, which. We were, I mean, we were like 120 months in a row of just living the dream in the hospitality industry. And all of a sudden this happens. But yet, as I mentioned before, this is not our first rodeo. We've been through this before with 9-11, SARS and Ebola and everything. Joan, why wasn't our industry ready this time? As many times as we've been through this. I, I, I want to take it a different step. Um, and and because we're in S, because we are going to talk more about ethics specifically. I want to bring an ethical piece into this. Um, I think two things. I think that I, I don't, I can't explain why we weren't ready. I think that there is a tendency. Um, I, I, my my grandmother, my mother's mother, used to when things were not when the talk wasn't we called happy talk, grandma would always say, "See the pretty birdie," and that meant let's change the subject, let's look on the bright side, but <laughs> find a way to make it pretty, right? Let's make it right. nice. Right. Um, and so I think that as I look back a year, um, we weren't even a year ago at this time talking about um, the reality of what we were seeing beginning to happen um, in Europe and China and, and around the world. We weren't talking about, we were in fact ignoring. Um, I remember posting information because I was listening to the WHO press briefings and they um, they were giving good advice. For example, I remember, you, you remember those moments in time. Um, I remember when Dr. Michael Ryan of WHO said about, it must have been the first week of February of 2020. And someone asked him about a telecom meeting that was to happen in Barcelona the following week. And I remember his words. He said, well, at this point, we think you should plan the same way you would for any risk, for any event. And I sat there and I'm shaking my head at the screen and talking back to him. Of course, he can't hear me. And I'm saying, but people don't write contingency plans for their meetings. You mentioned earlier that I that I work in contingency yes. and risk. Yes. To me, the reason it's, it's an, and, and this will, I'll go back in a second to why we weren't prepared and why we didn't prepare for a long time. To me, there's an ethical component. To me, being ethical is how you treat others. It's caring for others. It's understanding that it's not just about you. So our industry, um, I remember being yelled at in all caps in social media when I would post what I was hearing from WHO. And people said to me, no, Joan, it's only people over 85. It doesn't impact others. It's not in the United States. It's not this, it's not that. And, and then some would say later, um, it's people 65 and over. Um, there are those who still believe that this isn't a big deal. I don't know how you discount 515 um, is it 515 million lives? Yeah, thousand. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, so the, the the number of lives is stunning, um, and and I th what I've read is it's greater in the United States than it was for World, World War One, Two, and Vietnam. So if we if we as an industry didn't want to take it seriously, wanted to say 
see the pretty birdie. Let's keep meeting. Let's act as if um, we can overcome this. And we did that for a long time. It was months yeah. before the industry did anything. To me, that's unethical. To me, to put people in harm's way is not acting ethically. And and you know, I, I printed out so that I'd have it in front of me. I was um, all all the industry associations have codes of conduct, codes of ethics. I helped when ASAE redid theirs. I helped write it, and. For those who are CMP certified meeting professionals, there is a code of conduct. So I'm using that as sort of a baseline um, for the discussion. And as I look at it, it, it um, it's interesting because one of the, the the third bullet point in it says this: perform my responsibilities in accordance with the laws and regulations of the local, state, or national governments um, under which I reside. And so I would I would add to that it would be under in which I'm holding an event um, to which I'm going to travel, and we know that in the United States and throughout the world the regulations have changed. They change sometimes every week. Um, we know that they they may not be the same, and they may not be what we want them to be. And yet, as a responsible industry practitioner. I think that we have an obligation to understand what the risks are, to prepare for risks. And you know, that's the other thing, Deborah, that's interesting. When you asked why were we not prepared? Once the industry as a whole decided that we would be prepared, I guess, they the only thing that was done was around cleaning. It was let's make all the surfaces clean, let's um there wasn't as much emphasis on distancing or on masking. It was let's clean surfaces. It was why we none of us could could find Clorox wipes. In, right. I'm not promoting a brand, but as an example. And so I think that um, I think that you know friends always say follow the money. I think mm -hmm. really there is a financial impact on the industry. I mean, obviously, we the number of meetings that have canceled the the room nights that have canceled, the people who aren't traveling, it has devastated yeah. the industry. And that gets back to it devastated people. Right. Um, it's devastated communities. So right. I, um, I don't know. I can't answer for others. Mm -hmm. I was prepared. I had conversations with others about this. I posted information. Um, and to this day, there are still people who think that everything is fine and that we don't need to mask. Um, there's a, there's been a, a lot of discussion in industry groups about a meeting that um, just occurred in Florida. And it was heartbreaking to me that when the participants, the hotel policy was to wear a mask and meaning everybody, their, their staff, as well as anybody in the hotel, vendors, participants in an event, and at this event, it was reported that the audience booed when when they were told to mask. Hmm. It was reported by the hotel that when their staff told the participants in this meeting to wear a mask, that they were treat the the, the the staff of the hotel were um, were yelled at and and hmm. criticized for telling people what to do. And I'm thinking, where's the respect for others? That to me, again, to me, it's ethical to respect um, the health and safety of other people. Right. And it's like, you know, if you go into a restaurant and there's a sign that says, no shoes, no shirt, no service, we don't balk over that. But when it has no. to do something as as updated as a mask, we're balking at it. And people need to get on the same page about this and respect what others, you know, want them to do when you go into their territory, or their building. So, yeah, I think we're going to, that's not probably going to be the last time we're going to hear that or, or a sim similar situation like that, because people are, are still trying to adjust um, and pivot and adapt and whatever other words there are to this new, this now normal that we're going through. And I'm sure we're going to have some people hop on today's show to comment um, what you are, are sharing 
and asking questions. As a matter of fact, we've got the one and only David Kleiman, who uh, gave us some top, the, the actual updated numbers for the U.S. Yeah, 515, um, of 515,000, right. yep, yeah, deaths. Yeah. So thank you, David. We really appreciate that. Yeah, and I, and the, needs, reason, the reason I was thinking million, <laughs> David, and others is because I, I well, look daily at the worldwide total as well as the, the U.S. totals mm -hmm. and my local totals and where they're going. And um, mm -hmm. what they know now is hospitalizations are down, um, which is good. It, it's for the healthcare workers, especially, it's good. Right. Um, it also is good for all of those um, who need cancer treatment and other right. who weren't able to get it during all of um, all of the hospitalizations. So I yeah. think that, that to me, it's it's a huge issue. And I think that um, as we talk, I think that that's part of it. Yeah. And of course, he, he believes it feels like millions anyway. But he does does he does agree with you. Um, you know, COVID is real. Um, and although it might not seem like it around your home life, um, it is happening. And we thought that in my family until my husband's aunt died back in New York because of COVID. So I know it hits home with some people, but I think people need to start realizing and respecting and taking it as an ethical behavior, like you mentioned. So speaking of ethics, let's, let's move on to that um, because that's why we are here to, uh, to talk about your expertise in that area. Can you start us out? You did a little bit earlier in the show, but a little bit of our details of, of defining what ethics really is, because I know there's some confusion with uh, DEI and you know people get that kind of mixed up. And today, ethics is gonna be more, more important than ever. So th there are definitions and I chose one that I will read um, because it's a simple one. It's short, and it says a set of standards um, of con a set of standards of conduct that guide decisions and actions based on duties derived from core values, and that comes from a, um, a, a book. Um, you can look up what um, ethics means in a lot of different ways. The industry. Um, it, it's been interesting. I've been in this industry a very long time. Um, we'll just do numbers. More than fifty years. And what I've seen is how the um, the issues have and haven't changed. Now, there's been obviously a big gap from 2019 to now. It was still in 2019 when you asked people, what are the big ethics issues? It usually was that um, it was around, quote, fam trips, familiarization trips. Um, if people were invited to go see a facility or a city and whether or not it was... Um, Right. I, I kosher, ethical to uh, to go. Right. And I think that it it has gone way beyond that. Um, and so let me sort of walk through what I've seen in the industry as issues. Okay. So fam trips became a lot of it. There are the issue. There's the issue of gift giving. Um, there's an acceptance. There's the issue of entertainment. Um, I saw in one year two clients that fired um, their directors of meetings, both of whom were CMPs, who um, who behaved in not only what, in violating the ethical, um, the ethical standards, the ethical statements of their employers, they also violated in spirit and in fact, the CMP code of ethics. Um, Early on, and David will certainly remember this as will others, MPI had one of, I would call the, um, I was trying to think of the right word. I don't want to say strict, strong, um, most detailed ethics policies there was. And there was a committee that if you believe that if someone had violated um, one of those standards, that you could report that. Um, and then they would investigate and they, a person could lose their um, their membership and, and MPI. In today's world with CMP, a person who has a CMP can be reported to the CMP board and they will investigate what happens. Now, what hap what's interesting is that there is a lot of wiggle room in what people perceive as ethical. So let's look at entertainment. Um, and let's look at the, the, the lines that are crossed in doing business and friendships. 
Um, a lot of us, um, you and I, for example, know each other because of the industry. Right. I would say that some of my best friends are people that I that I made through the industry, and a lot of them are people that we consider suppliers. It would be very would have been, and this is what happened in the case of um, one of actually both of the clients, um, people who plan meetings or directors. Um, it it is very it, it's very easy when you're friends with someone to talk about what's going on in your life, how th tough things are, and then to say in passing, maybe innocently, I am so tired. I've been working so many hours. You know, I've got this big meeting coming up on and on and on, right? All this stuff that's going on. And for the supplier to then say, um, gosh, wouldn't, I bet you would love an opportunity to come stay at our hotel and use the spa. Okay. Right. And the planner says, wow, that would be so great. And then the supplier begins to make the offer firm. So what, what we've seen in the industry is we've gone from these, um, these codes that MPI had, um, and not just MPI, ASAE, everybody else had them. SGMP, Society of Government Meeting Professionals, still has an enforceable code, I believe. If I'm wrong, I hope somebody lets me know that. And most of them are what we call aspirational. Um, and I always describe that as meaning, I really, really want to be ethical, but oh, well, I don't have to be because nothing's going to happen if I'm not. And so I think that what we've done um, in an industry that to me has opportunities for stuff, for um, doing nice things for people, and that includes a drawing at a trade show. Um, right. You know, you and I talked about are there stories? Have I got stories yeah. about um, people who, um, who who I've seen, you know, when we used to put business cards in a bowl, go right. through those cards and pick out the customer. Um, right. I've gotten calls over all the years I've been in, in the industry of what do I do? This just happened. And so we have no enforcement. We literally have no enforcement of ethics codes. Um, the worst that can happen if you're a CMP is you have your CMP stripped. If someone reports what you've done, if the CMP board decides you violated the code of ethics, but in reading it, it's not terribly measurable the way that MPI's was before um, MPI developed the principles of professionalism, which includes issues around diversity and inclusion and sustainability. So if we look at what the industry says are ethical behaviors. What I don't understand and never will is why we aren't why we aren't why aren't we talking about it more? Right. Why do why is this not on the agenda of every PCMA, MPI, everybody's chapter, um, yearly at least? My corporate um, planner friends um, and and a lot of suppliers have to take a yearly um, uh, I'm going to call it a test online of, um, of on ethical issues. And what's mm -hmm. interesting is that it's pretty obvious what the right answer is. To me, taking a test doesn't doesn't tell you if how you're behaving. It's what you right. do on a daily basis, right? Right. right. So right. I think that um, the issues may have changed. And 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 I know that one of the things you and I wanted to talk about was how they may be changing or changed now because the employment market is so bad and right. people have no money. So um, is that okay if I go into that? Yeah, absolutely. And yet yet I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, going, you know, I really feel guilty that I stole that stapler at one of the hotels after I left, you know, but, but, but at the same time, Ooh. I'm thinking, I only, I didn't even, you know, if I even got caught doing that, I would only gotten a slap on the hand. Maybe well, it's not strict me, enough. So let me, you know what, let me, let me address that. That's an interesting okay. one. So okay. there, there is, um, I won't name names. There's an industry attorney with whom I presented um, on contracts and on ethics. And when we present on ethics, what's really interesting is that we talk about the, 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 the fine line between what's ethical and legal. Right. One of the exercises we do, and, and I do independently, is um, 
you see someone in an office or let's say at a hotel um, taking something, right? <laughs> they, the, you know, the staff office was equipped with whatever it was, the stapler, right. a copier, whatever it might be. Right. And someone decides to leave with whatever they leave with. Um, and so what we always hear, always hear that it depends on the value. So if I, t if let's say that I'm in an MPI chapter or PCMA or SGMP or anybody, any part of the industry, or let's say that I'm part of a civic organization or a religious group, um, okay. and I'm head of the fundraising committee and I need to print off some flyers because I want to put them up because not everybody is going to see it online. Right. So I make copies. So the question always comes up, how many become unethical? Right. Is it five? Is it 50? Is it 100? Is it if I take a ream of paper and yes. take that out? Do, if I wheel out a copier? Um, and so often people believe that you measure ethics by the value of the item, whether it's the um, the, the physical mm. item, the mm. gift you've been given. Some companies, oh, this is interesting too, because some companies say that there is a dollar value on what you can accept, right? So whether it's a meal or right. a gift, um, right. and so let's say it's $50, but often what it doesn't say is, is it $50 from one supplier or one vendor a year, a month, a day, an hour? Um, it, it's not specific. And so what this attorney and I talk about is that fine line. And because this person happens, um, is married to a prosecutor, um, they address the issue of what could in fact be illegal. Um, and so I have this thing that, I, you know, I, I understand need, I get it. Um, and I think right now there are huge needs for housing and certainly for food. Um, and people don't have it. Um, if I could if I could do more, I would. And so the question becomes, if let's say I'm an out of work meeting planner and I am offered um, a week of meals delivered to my home by a supplier friend and I, and I have other people to feed in my home, is it okay for me to take it? I can't answer that. Mm -hmm. it is, it's up to us individually. If someone's unemployed, how do they, what do they want the perception um, of their behavior to be? Um, I remember, it's funny, he's back in the news. So um, Russell Honore, General Honore, who was called the Katrina General, um, is now, um, I, I think he's in charge of the, the commission or at least the investigation into the insurrection on Capitol Hill on the 6th of January. So General Honore and I spoke five years after Katrina. Um, I had a wonderful opportunity to interview him and fell totally in love with his thinking. Um, so back to the issue of being prepared. So we talked about the issue of looting after a disaster and what um, the, what the ethical implications are of that. Um, we didn't talk about the legal implications. And what we talked about was if you're starving, if your family's starving, if you've just lost your home, if you have nothing, is it ethical right. to do something, to accept right. something? Right. And I think that that's where it gets really tough. Yeah. Um, and I have had times in my career when money was not coming in and it would have been very easy to have gone to someone and said, you know, I, we're, I'm hungry. I need whatever it is I need. Or I will, t I will confess this right here on your show. Um, <laughs> I, I have, you know, if I ever fully retire, I'm not never retiring, but if I did, let's say that if illness got worse, um, it, there's a real temptation to say to someone with an airline and someone with a hotel company, I just really want a break. I just really, before I die, want to have something really nice happen. Mm -hmm. I do mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's not yeah. what you said yes. So I don't know, you know, when I was called the conscience of the industry, it was by 
a former MPI president, um, and he, and it was said at a, a meeting. Um, and it's a very it's a very tough thing to carry. It it doesn't. I think that people think that when you're ethical, you're being a goody two shoes, which nobody wants to be called. Evidently, um, I I think it reflects on individuals. I think it reflects on the industry. If we if we look at the legal issues, when the AIG stuff happened, when the um, which uh, was it? Shoot, I can't remember the the issue in Vegas of the government meeting where the the government planner was pictured in a, um, a, a bathtub drinking champagne over right. the trip, right? And was that right? Okay, right. Right. Um, right. And so uh, each of us has to set an ethical compass that that complements what our employer or clients, in my case, it's clients, say. Um, what the industry, um, what the industry says, mm -hmm. and not necessarily what the industry does, because the mm -hmm. industry, for instance, if if we go, if if meetings fully resume, there will be again lots of entertainment at those meetings. Not everybody will be invited. In other words, it will be a supplier who says, "I'm going to take our quote best customers, our former best customers, perhaps, and we're going to we're taking them out for a nice dinner." Um, it's not open to everybody. And so I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't have easy answers. I do. I want to, um, I had, I, I found a really great quote some years ago and oh, I, yes. I want to read this one because um, yes. I really love it. Um, and and I think we can show that on the screen for can you, you? Too. Yes, we do. Oh, definitely. Great. Let me do that. We we posted the uh, the ethics definition in the chat for Thank those you. that are on, which I think was fantastic. But here's the the, the quote that you wanted. Thank you for doing that. There you um, go. Thanks so much. So this to me is great. And this is something that I think if everybody thought about in terms of um, every time they're faced with a question, instead of just acting on what they think. I think that the ability to ask this, and so I want to say it out loud because I think we often comprehend differently for those who can hear. Um, how should an individual confronted with an ethical dilemma reach a decision that is competitively, organizationally, economically, and ethically sound? And to meet those criteria, to think about how that makes a difference is not easy. Um, so thank you for sharing that. And I, 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 I encourage people um, to Absolutely. Um, either from Deborah or from me to, to get that and to, um, to use it when they're faced with dilemmas. Um, I think that we, I think today in today's business world, and I think as we resume meeting um, in any fashion, and it's Still, we're doing meetings virtually. Uh, most everybody I know is. Um, there are still dilemmas, and it's not just. You know, I'm thinking about my spouse who's worked for associations, and I remember the first time um, we had a discussion about um, because of the work um, th that they do. He said um, he was offered tickets to a hockey game. He loves hockey, and so. It was, am I allowed to take that? And and no, the, their policy was clear. You take nothing from someone with whom you may do business because it looks as if if we do do business with them, that we were in essence bribed by that. And so if you take one thing, then what's the expectation? Um, right. And so it goes back again to friendships, right? So if I, um, when you could go out and have a meal with, others. Um, if I have if I have a meal with someone with whom I'm doing business um, or potentially going to do business on behalf of clients, do I pay or should they pay? And if they are really a friend, as in we don't just get together because we're doing business, we make a decision that we split. My turn, your turn, my turn, your turn. If one of us can't afford it, then the other one assumes that. And there's an agreement that neither of us will put it in for reimbursement for me with a client 
for the, the, the vendor with their company. Um, I won't write it off. Um, it will be a friend meal. And, and I, you know, you asked me about the experiences and I'm very good at forgetting really bad stuff. Uh, it's, I think it's, it's the way I cope, right? So, um, and yet, we want to forget the bad stuff. <laughs> we do want to forget the bad stuff. And that said, I think of the things that I've seen people do that I have observed, that I have heard of. Um, I've seen people fired from jobs because of not performing ethically, violating the policies of their companies yeah. or organizations still get other jobs and no one because of laws we can't someone can't say why um i always say the industry talks and there used to be long ago um that, that people would say well you don't want it to appear on the appear on the front page of the paper right and so i still read papers and i would not want it there um i think that what we don't want is for people to talk about us and to say you don't want to do business with that person because all they're going to do is to ask you for stuff. They're going to expect um, as much, quote, as much as they can get, whether it's for the meeting as a meeting planner or whether it's for, um, in, in a, a supplier's case, for their entity. And again, you know, if we measure the economics of how we do business, how that plays into ethics. Right. It's complicated. Right. Right, right. And uh, we have a couple comments that have come through exactly what you are saying here. One is is from Bob and and he says, you know, the reality to it is, is that ethics and respect is is not in company seen by U.S. citizens, um, in particular U.S. citizens. We're getting bad about that. Worse, if anything. Well, so let me comment on that. And that's thank you, Bob. That's an interesting comment. And part of it is also in, in the beginning of my career, um, we weren't doing as much business internationally. The ethics in the, how we behave ethically, ethics policies in the US, how we do business in the US is not how business is done in all countries. And in some countries, it is acceptable for money under the table, for bribes to do, to do what for me is unethical, for others and other cultures, is considered how business is done. So if I'm doing business with someone from another culture, I need to think about what that means. I don't, I don't know that I think that our ethical behavior is any worse today than it was when I started in this industry. Um, I see the same things happening. I see the policies that are aspirational. Um, I see no accountability. I, again, I don't see programs other than this, thank you, um, where we're talking about ethics on a, 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 on a regular basis. Um, when I tweeted about the program, I said it's not a sexy topic. I was actually told that when I when I chaired an ethics um, education <laughs> committee, that it yeah. wasn't, ethics and diversity weren't sexy. Um, right. And so, um, people don't want to talk about it. They don't want to delve into what behavior is appropriate. Right. And I think we need to. We definitely do. And on top of that, um, Visibly Media wanted to ask you, how how about online, though? I mean, that, this is all new for being ethical online. Um, yeah. Um, and, and, <laughs> and, and it extends to um, how we deal with that, I think, yeah. as well. So I think that there are a lot, a lot more groups um, who didn't necessarily have um, standards of behavior for their physical, I call them physical meetings, as opposed to face to face, because we're face to face. Right. Um, so they didn't have standards of behavior, although people began to do that more around DEI and sexual harassment than around other ethical issues. So there, there are there were standards for virtual meetings. There are many more organizations that have developed standards because we we have chat open, right? And so when chat is open, people can um, easily put something in there that may not be appropriate. So there are a number. So let me deal virtually. So there, if you look at the same issues in terms of doing business, so. Um, 
sending a proposal, sending an RFP for the uh, to get a proposal for the platform to use. Right. There could be offers of almost anything in the same way it would be for using a hotel. Sure. If um, we don't set standards of behavior and explain them over and over for what people should do, if we don't have someone monitoring a chat and then saying in the chat and removing someone if they're inappropriate, then to me, that's not being ethical. And so I think that that um, there um, one of the people that I rely on for a lot of this is Sherry Martz, M-A-R-T-S. Um, she has become a, a, um, a valued colleague um, through ASAE, and she does a lot of work in setting, helping groups set um, behavioral standards for physical meetings and for virtual meetings, what people should do, how they should behave, and then I think it's each up to each of us to ask the questions and not take for granted how people, um, what's appropriate in terms of how we interact, um, what we should and shouldn't do. No, let me take that back. I don't want to do should and shouldn't. What's appropriate to do? Because should and shouldn't sounds like there's um, that there's a. a there's ethical and sort of ethical and maybe ethical and gray areas. And um, I think that we all have to decide what, what look at the ethical standards. I don't know companies that don't have some sort of ethics standards. Um, when, when I'm doing business, what I recommend to clients when they start the process with new vendors, disclose your ethical standards yeah. state what the meeting planners immediately right state what the meeting planners can do around going out for meals mm -hmm. accepting gifts mm -hmm. not accepting gifts value right. of gifts I mean, right. you put everything be transparent right. about yeah. it immediately immediately yes absolutely Totally, totally right about that. Um, and we only have like about, oh gosh, 12 minutes left in the show. Um, so what I thought would be is if you can kind of recap um, your takeaways, I believe you have three of them there that you've been talking about throughout the entire hour already, but just to kind of give a, a, a synopsis and recap, I think people would really uh, enjoy hearing that from you. I hope so. So I think the first is know, know yourself. Um, understand what motivates you and understand what allows you to operate in a way that um, I, I, some people will say how your parents, grandparents, somebody wouldn't, I always say, what if that was your parents were Bonnie and Clyde? Um, and so I, I think that think about how you want to be perceived and, and how, what you want your reputation to be. Second of all, if you have, if your company has, or your organization has a written code of conduct, which they should, um, in, in most cases do, read it and ask questions about how it specifically applies to the work you do. Um, ask your partners, whether you're a supplier or a planner or a vendor of anything else, ask your partners what their ethics policies are and how you can work together to maintain an ethical um, and an economically healthy relationship. And I think lastly, um, constantly monitor what the industry is doing, what you think crosses a line um, for you or crosses an industry line based on ethics policies. And look at that. And then if you believe that you've, you've observed or experienced an ethical behavior, if you can find it in a comfortable way to report that unethical, beha unethical behavior based on what a written policy says. Um, if we don't hold people accountable, we're never going to succeed as an industry and in being perceived ethically. And right now we are still fighting, we're fighting for, for recognition still yet, we're fighting for money. Um, we have hit, gotten some huge hits in the past because of others' behavior. And I think it's important that we take the time to, um, to say, and even to an individual, what I saw you do, what I what I observed, what I heard, um, seemed to violate a policy with our own company. If it's a coworker, violate the CMP standards if they are a CMP, um, violate any of the industry statements. And and again, I I want you to look at them, even if you're not a member of MPI and PCMA, 
SGMP, HSMAI, all of the, the EIC members um, understand what it says and what it means and how that will guide what you do. All great points, my goodness, and so much information into into one hour. It's it's definitely definitely incredible. And um, I know that. Uh, oh, let's see. Um, somebody is saying here. Oh yeah, uh, Lisa Raymond saying that if um, ethic solution is um, encountered, who should that be reported to? Oh, that's a very good question. That's a good question. So I would if it's um, if it is a coworker. Um, I would start with talking to the person and saying, this is what I observed. Can you tell me more? Um, tell me more is always a good way to, to, to go forward. Um, if um, the person explains it and you still believe it was unethical, um, if you have an HR department, um, whatever it might be, I would go to them um, or to their supervisor, your supervisor. If it's an industry issue, if you see someone um, that has behaved against let's say the CMP policy or any of the others, I would again, talk to the person to clarify the situation. And then um, for CMP, the board will, um, does require you to put it in writing. I, you know, it's interesting. I don't know that um, the other industry associations are doing more than aspirational um, for people who are members. And even though I've asked the question many times, I think that it's more people are expected to read them. I think that when you join or renew, um, you sign something that says you read them and agree to abide by them. So in that case, I would go to, um, if it's your chapter, if it's the national organization and say, um, I'm uncomfortable with a situation without naming the person and just say, what do I do with it? And because I, I don't know that, um, I don't know how it's set up. Um, I have had, I've had people come to me. Um, I always feel like a mother confessor. <laughs> and uh, people have said, this is what happened. Can you help guide me through it? And, and so we've talked it through. I can't offer that to everybody. Um, I'm always glad to get emails and, and try to answer them, connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, yeah. And I'll help you think it through. Right. Uh, I think that it helps to have written guidelines. And I would ask for written guidelines about what you should do. And I would demand it of our industry associations. I think that that whether it's a membership organization to which you pay a membership or it's an informal group, I think um, defining what is ethical behavior would be helpful. Yeah. And the way people can connect with you is definitely through your email as well as social media, I would imagine, too. Yeah. 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 And well, I, I always I always do a caution, Deborah. Um, <laughs> um, on Facebook, uh, I am me, and I mean, and, um, and I don't accept all friendships because I need to have some place to be myself. Um, sure. I do on LinkedIn. Um, it's my name, so it's easy to find. Oh and, yeah. And, and I'm always glad to talk to people about all of these issues. I, I think that I've always viewed my role in this industry as being an educator and a learner, and and I think that through helping others, I learn. I see what's going on. Um, and I want I want us as a profession, a large, big, all that we are, to be perceived well. I want us not to be thought of as takers, as users, as um, people who take advantage of situations. Right. I, I want I want us to be professionals, and to be professional is to be ethical. Um, it's why um, doctors and lawyers and accountants and others have ethics standards that are not just aspirational. And so I think that we as an industry need to put more emphasis on ethical behavior. Well, that is that is definitely like what David Kleiman has mentioned, the wise words from a wise woman. There's no doubt about it on such a sexy topic too, <laughs> on top of it. <laughs> well, this is great. I can't even imagine um, anybody wanting their ethics to be on the the you know the the bad road to success it, it's not going to happen so i think to be successful even today and tomorrow 
the ethics have to be there. And you have certainly given us a wealth of information on there. Thank you so much. And before we go, I just wanted to ask you one more question. Where did um, I get my earrings? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, right. <laughs> but but really, I you know, what did you learn through this whole time that we've we've been through this and uh, you know, for Joe and Eisenstadt we learned from you but what did you actually learn out there you mean from COVID the whole this from year the whole COVID oh year what was the what, one thing well, that what really I've learned, gotcha what I've learned is that everybody's my grandmother and they see the pretty birdie and they want um they want everything to be lovely and it's not and i think that what i've also learned is there are people i may cry because i get emotional but people like jose andres the chef um who has literally been feeding the world through world central kitchen and i see examples like that and in my own community there are restaurants where people where the restaurant is not taking in much money but they found a way to keep their employer employees employed and they are feeding other people. And so what I've seen is both sides, an incredible generosity and a total, um, a total see the pretty birdie. So I think that um, what I've learned is I, I'm glad that I'm me. I'm glad that I'm a realist. I'm glad that I plan for contingencies. I'm glad that I uh, am a learner who delves into issues and understands what goes on. And um, much more than I even share in social media. And so what I've learned is um, when there is a crisis, when it involves the lives of people, that we have an obligation to others um, to make sure that they remain safe and well. Um, because in the end, um, when travel resumes in full, um, when meetings change um, again, um, yep. to whatever they'll be. Um, if people are too sick or don't have the money, they can't come back. And so if we look at it again from the economical issue, the questions asked in the Harvard Business Press, um, if we look at the economics issue, there's one side of it. If we look at it from a human standpoint, there's another. Um, I think that we have to look at what is the best way to be human. Yeah. Bottom line, great lesson, great lesson. And and I'm glad you like you, and I'm glad you you <laughs> like to be a realistic, but I tell you what, we liked having you here today. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. Um, gosh, again, the icon in the industry, my good friend, longtime friend, Joan Eisenstock. Thank you so much Thank for being you, here Barbara. with us. I know you're a busy lady and uh, gosh, I can't wait till we get back to, like you said, physical um, meetings so that we can get back to our hugs and kisses again. So until Thank then, you. You. So, we'll stay in touch. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you so much. Wow, I hope that you really enjoyed this conversation with the one and only Joan Eisenstadt. And thank you so much for joining us. And if you did like this conversation, by all means, do share the replays with others um, and also yourself. And uh, hopefully you'll get to listen and see all the in-depth information that she showed because we could have been here for another hour. We also want to thank our sponsor, uh, Versator, for uh, being with us and, and sponsoring this episode as well. And if you have any questions, uh, by all means, uh, reach out to us through our social media links or hello at hospitalitytodaylive.com. Well, we're on a continued roll here. Next up, we have for next Tuesday, Don Penfold. Don is the owner, founder of Meeting Jobs. And for that, we, what we talked about earlier today, about 5.5 million jobs out disappeared from the hospitality industry. Well, Don is responsible for helping us get back to work and finding those jobs. She will share with us what employers are looking for as far as skill sets for today and are those transferable if you switch industries and how is the hiring process changed since this pandemic and so much more that Don wants to share with us. So 
Be with us next Tuesday, same time, same channel. I'm Deborah Gardner. Thank you again for being here. And remember, if you're thinking about it, we're actually talking about it right here on Hospitality Today Live. Have a great week, everybody.